I think there is uh, anxiety on many sides today about the issue of Christianity and the secular society stroke state. On one side, in the last decade, there has been concern about the power of the churches in secular society. And you're in a part of the state of New South Wales where that kind of concern would much trouble many of your neighbours. Religion has too much to say, cry the new atheists. Religion poisons everything, says Christopher Hitchens. Everything? Yes, apparently. Uh, this has been it's a long and historical debate, but it has particular power in the last 10 years when it was discovered that one, despite all predictions and hopes, religion is not going away. And two, religion can take some forms that can be pretty scary, aka 9-11 and such like. That's one side. On the other side, uh, there is those of us who you may feel that the forces of secularism are circling attacking the faith and the sheer reality of living in a society that does not share the Christian's values on some things and yet does on others can be disconcerting and difficult. How should we react? What should our stance be? I want to start therefore by introducing the most confusing word in the title which is not the word Christian, it's the word secular. What does secular mean? The fact of the matter is it can mean a number of things a range of things. Some take it to mean anti-religious. There was, I think there was a secular, not a secular um, party or something, which is the party get get rid of religion. No, I mean, party like political, not having fun type party. The word secular can sometimes simply mean just simply neutral. Neutral. Um, the education acts in the 1880s were changed in this state. To, to create what was called free, compulsory, and secular education. By secular, they did not mean secular in that sense of no religion at all. They meant secular in the sense of we're going to be neutral. Uh, we're not going to promote any particular religion. In fact, you can come in and teach your own adherence for an hour a week every day, or a day or a day if it was firstly done. That, so that secular just meant by that not being neutral, but not negative. In fact, I wonder if you know where the word secular, what the word secular means originally. Anyone any idea the word secular? For this age, well done. The word secular means just the Latin word secularis, which just means a period of time. And secular, secularis came to mean simply of this time, contrasting it with the age to come, eternity. So whereas you might in one extreme think of secular is opposite to sacred, secular meaning just ordinary. The real opposite is not sacred, but eternal. But you could mean secular versus religious. You know, this side. Secular versus meaning keeping the state neutral, or secular meaning of this age. Now, which am I talking about? Well, I'm going to talk in a sense about all three. Um, but particularly, I want to talk about um, the secular state and the secular society. State is the official government policy and, and, and so forth, and society is that multifaceted community we live in. I've got two main New Testament passages. My first will be Mark 12, and my heading there is thank, thank God for the secular state. I want to start with what I think you probably will, at least you, when you hear what I've got to say, I think you'll agree with me, is the most significant tax advice ever given. The advice about tax which has shaped the nature and structure of the world we live in. Not just in Western culture, but the whole world, particularly Western culture. The tax advice happened when they came to Jesus and asked a seemingly innocent question. The question was this. This is Mark 12 and 14. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not pay? It was a question about the poll tax. The word taxes used here in the Greek language is the word census, kinos, from which the word census comes from. And it was a tax levied upon all Jews just for being. It wasn't, wasn't taxed on your income or upon 
your goods, it was just upon your head. It was a tax on that, and it was paid directly to the Romans. They were living under the authority of an empire which covered the whole Mediterranean world. So it's a tax which shows their subjection to a foreign power. You'll notice they, uh, they had a very smarmy and flattering introduction. When they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are the truthful. You are truthful and defer to no one. And you don't show partiality. But teach truthfully the way of God. Um, I know this church is associated with the media. This is a classic media trap. <laughs> uh, I was saying to Dominic over lunch, and for reasons that are not just me having a go, I think the modern-day media are, are one of the equivalents of the Pharisees, always moralizing, if hypocritical, and seeking to trap people. Um, at least that's my, my experience, as well as being some good ones. Well, that's what they're doing. They, they're smiling. They're saying, we know that you always teach. You don't. You don't care what people think. You teach God's way. Tell us, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not pay? But Jesus is onto them, knowing their hypocrisy, for in fact, they're not asking the question to get an answer. God forbid that. That would be why you'd ask a question. They're asking a question to trap him out. Uh, how untypical of the world today. And the trap is simply this. Any answer, yes or no, is wrong. Yes is wrong. No is wrong. So the trap is this. If you answer yes, then you are in effect endorsing the rule of the unbelievers and the godless and the idolaters over God's people Israel. If you answer no, then you're saying something which is effect to, to a seditious act and liable to put you into very serious trouble with those very unbelievers, idolaters who are running Israel. If you answer yes, paying taxes to Romans is lawful, are you not saying that Israelites, God's people, should serve human masters rather than God? That poll tax about which they asked the question had been a spark for an attempted revolt and liberation in Jesus' own childhood area. When Jesus was about 10, in Galilee, in 6 AD, there was a rebellion over this very tax, led by one Judas the Galilean. And uh, the Jewish historian Josephus writes as follows, In, his in, this, in this, his time, a Galilean named Judas tried to stir up the natives to revolt, saying that they'd be cowards if they submitted to paying taxes to the Romans and after serving God alone, accepted human masters. And here is another Galilean, Jesus, in the temple in Jerusalem, um, acting as though he owned the place, as it were. And so they put to him the question, the, the loaded question, which Judas the Galilean led a revolt. Uh, some 20 so years earlier. But if you said no, you said yes, you were saying yes, you should serve, pay the Romans, say no, well of course you're taking up Judas's cause and we'll hear what happened to him in just a moment. So what will he do? Oh by the way, what happened to Judas, the Galilean? He's actually mentioned in the New Testament. In the Acts of the Apostles, um, chapter 5, the Rabbi Gamaliel is talking about various movements that came to a rather sticky end, and he mentions Judas. He says in verse 37, Judas the Galilean arose at the time of the census, the tax census, you see, that's what the census was for, to pay taxes, and got people to follow him. He perished, and all who followed him were scattered. The Romans came down with, on him like all tyrannical uh, dictators and foreign powers, he was, he was killed and his, many of his followers killed and so forth. So which is it to be? Will Jesus be discredited, a mere follower of the Romans, or will he be seditious? By the way, the people who ask the questions themselves are a strange bunch of bedfellows. 
we're told that they sent the Pharisees and the Herodians. Uh, you may not know this, but the Pharisees and Herodians are a very unlikely team. The Pharisees were the leading pious party, despite my earlier comments about their hypocrisy. They are more likely to be those who'd say, God alone. The Herodians were the cronies of Herod Antipas of Galilee, who was a pro-Roman client king. They, I mean, they, he was in bed with the Romans. His father, Herod the Great, had got his position because of sucking up the Herod to Mark Antony and then uh, sucking up to Octavian. So why the group who were most pro-Roman and the group most anti-Roman are getting together to ask the question? Well, you can guess. Why are you testing me, said Jesus. Well, there's the trap. Now, the answer was memorable. And can you turn to the next slide, which is like this slide, only without the words. He asked them, bring me a denarius, he said to look at. And that's what you're looking at right now. The poll tax had to be paid in Roman coinage. A denarius, worth about a day's wage for a labourer, it was an objectionable Roman coin. It is silver. It has the image of Tiberius, somewhat dolled up, looking a bit like a very great person, a blasphemous image. And the words around the edge I've tried to work them out. If you start down near his chest, T, that's for Tiberius, Caesar, Caesar, then Divi, which is divine. Now, I get a bit lost now. I've been trying to work it out. Uh, Aug, which probably would mean Augustus. F, I think the word Philly means son. I know how it goes. Basically, it says this, Tiberius, Caesar, son of of the divine Augustus. His father, adopted father, that's how you uh, was Octavian, who later called Augustus, the August One. And when he died, he'd been declared to have become a god. And he, therefore, was the son of a god, uh, Tiberius, the son of the deified or divine Augustus. Now, you don't need to know much, but that is a fairly objectionable title blasphemous and idolatrous on the coin. Other transactions done by Jews were done with less objectionable copper coins, but the poll tax was done in this silver coin. And that's what Jesus asks. When we read in verse 16, they brought one. And Jesus points to it, I imagine. We're not told a gesture, but he simply asks this question. Whose image and inscription is this? Caesar's, they said. Then came the memorable answer that changed the history of the politics of the Western world from that day to this. He said, give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God things that are God's. You may know it in its more old-fashioned terms, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. A phrase from the authorised version that's become one of those phrases that's got a, its own life in our culture. It's hard to know quite the meaning, how to read it. Is it, is it meant to be even balanced? Give, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's? Or is it meant to be weighted well, give back to Caesar things that are Caesar's, but to God, the things that are God's. You know, kind of weight down. It's quite, very hard to quite know how to read it. Whichever it is, he is not saying there are two separate realms. There's the religious and the political, and they never meet. No. What he's saying is that under God, there is still a place for Caesar. It's not a zero sum. You can be a child of the living God, a servant of the living God, and yet still pay what the emperor is due. Even if the emperor happens to be a worshipper of false gods and a man given to blasphemous vanity, as the Roman emperors undoubtedly were. But it was an important and far-reaching teaching affirming that God and the emperor are not incompatible for the believer. 
See, despite Old Testament theocracy, Jesus and the fact that Jesus spoke all about a kingdom, the kingdom of God, God becoming king, he never pretended to nor made any claim that the Christian faith, as it later came to be called, that, that they weren't his way of describing it, but what we now call it, was ever interested in the exercise of political power or with the violence that goes with it. Even though he would later tell Pilate that Pilate would have no authority unless it had been given to him from above, Pilate the Roman governor, Jesus would then tell the governor, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my followers would fight. But it is not of this world. That's a critical moment when Jesus gave that answer to the question about tax. Give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give back to God the things that are God's. It's a critical moment in the history of the world, civilization. Unlike Islam, for example, here we find clearly stated and in principle distinction between what would later be called church and state. A distinction between church and state, already exemplified by Jesus. And it paves the way for the church to be at home in a secular state, at least not a Christian one. You can still be servants of God and live in a state governed by Tiberius Caesar, son of of the deified Augustus. Now, there's been a long history of that distinction. Uh, it's been a very powerful distinction. I, I know it's true that for well over a thousand years, the Christian ideal, for a millennium, the Christian ideal was to have a state which was Christian, where the Christian faith was the state and society's religion. That only, that, that only collapsed in the 17th and 18th centuries. But even there, that even in Christendom, the distinction between emperor and church was still important. There's evidence today that the church, at least, and the Christian faith flourishes best, actually, when the state is secular in the sense of neutral. as in the USA. One reason why I believe the Christian faith flourishes better in the United States than it does in Europe is because the United States, despite early efforts of, the, of the, some of the colonists, soon discovered that, that, that the best way forward was to have the state neutral on religion, rather in Europe, where many churches were established by law. But that has led actually to more freedom for, and flourishing of the Christian faith. So apparently having the state enforcing you is bad news for you as a religion. You can, after coffee, you can work out why that might be uh, as we talk about that. Here in Australia, we started sort of with an established church, and us Anglicans have been losing power ever since. Um, we, but we do have in this state, we're not quite the American, which is formally neutral, but we do have remarkable freedom of religion. We have a secular state, and certainly the state is not allowed to impose a test religious test for any office, nor can it establish any church. Or, and that's good. And if we, if despite all the problems you may feel at times, we live in a secular state, thank God for the secular state. We have remarkable freedom of religion. The only threats come from overzealous attempts to improve society by overreaching of anti-discrimination laws or refusal to allow Christian conscience on some moral issues. Um, doctors in, in, in Victoria, there's a problem developing there, and not being able to conscientiously refuse to engage. But those issues come up from time to time. And a bit of sabre-rattling by the secularists in the, in the extreme sense. And I'm not saying these issues aren't serious, but they're not, that, they're not that to be worried about too much compared to the rest of the world, I can tell you that. So that's my first heading. Thank God for the secular state. Let me move now to my second Live faithfully in the secular society. And for this, I want you to come with me now, 30 years after Jesus gave that famous tax advice. Come with me to 
the writings of Peter, writing to Christian, Christians living, and now you can call them Christians with the name it got caught on by now, living in the various cities and villages of what is, was then called uh, Asia. Today we'd call it Turkey uh, and Anatolia. These Christians are living in a hostile society. And yet, although it is 30 years later, a very different context, you, as we read what Peter's got to say, we can see how he seems also to take up Jesus' double focus and expand it of God and the emperor in fresh ways. We're seeing Peter writing, in a sense, a reinterpretation of Jesus' words uh, in a fresh context. That they're living in a hostile society is very clear throughout the letter. Although their society was not secular in the modern sense of anti-religion, it wasn't because it was, in fact, a very religious society. Everybody was religious in some way. It was thought inconceivable not to have a religion. Um, but it's parallel to us in that the religion they had was very indifferent and hostile to the Christian faith. So it was like sector in the sense of it was a hostile to the Christian's society that they lived in. And what does Peter say to them? How do they live in that hostile society? Well, uh, you could summarize what he says in one clear sentence, and that's verse 16 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. He wrote, as God's slaves live as free people, but don't use as your freedom as a way to conceal evil. That is, on one hand, they are slaves of God, and therefore they are free from the society. They are free, and yet that freedom is not to be used as a way, a pretext for doing wrong. They are to give to God what is God's, but in doing so, not avoid giving the emperor what is the emperor's. Let's see how this goes. And I've got two points. Um, maintain your identity and act honorably. Maintain your identity is the render to God the things that are God's, and the act honorably is going to be about giving due honor and due service to the secular society. Firstly, maintain and live out your identity. As God's slaves, live as free people. Give back to God what is God's. This is most important, I believe, for the Christian church and Christians today. Unless you know who you are, you'll do nothing but become completely lost, completely enculturated in your society. There'll be no distinction between the Christian and the society. The Christian faith will become a private uh, option in their lives, a hobby. Some people collect stamps, others uh, believe in God. It means it makes no, no more difference to one or the other. That's the danger unless identity is clear. And Peter here uh, does, at the end of a long section, give this wonderful statement of their identity. You see it in verse 9 and following. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And yet they're not at home in the society. Verse 11, next sentence. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that war against you. So the first point is, this is what you are. Not citizens of your cities, not members of your guilds, of your families, or your trades, whatever the way people could be identified, not even of your race, but members, not even members of your own society. Now, you are members first and foremost of God's people, the chosen race, the royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's who you are first and foremost. And in fact, in the society you're in, you now find yourself as a stranger and a temporary resident. Not a permanent resident, but really one, as it were, living a somewhat marginal and liminal context. Now, when that identity is weak, when the Christian goes native and compromised, then Christ becomes an add-on to who they really are. And when that happens, it is normally catastrophic 
for the Christian church. It can happen without knowing it. You can have it, if, if all is quiet, you can go native and not notice it. Sometimes things happen that show horrifically when a church has done that. The worst thing about the Rwandan genocide back last century, when there were people suddenly tribal differences erupted in horrific violence in that African, Central African country, the scariest thing was that Rwanda was a country which had been had significant Christianity. But when the crunch came, tribal identity trumped Christian identity. And just in case you think that's anti-African, you may say, what about last century in Europe? Uh, one long or two great wars. And this church, by the way, bears many marks. I guess thinking they're looking around. You look around at some of these very sad windows about this, this parish back in 1916 and 17 was horrifically hit um, by the death on the Somme and then at Poziers. And you can think of the grieving, and those, you know, the grieving community, this area, fighting in a far-off place, Christian England and France and Christian Germany. You know. But national identity had well and truly replaced Christian identity. And, and that's a terrible thing. That's obvious seeing it out there. That's what happens. Or just simply the Christian church becomes a pale reflection of, of its world. And that's always the danger, by the way. We use the worldly things. You know, we can look very, very worldly. You lose your identity. You become secular. And the primary battle, you'll notice, is not with a pagan society. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and temporary residents to watch out against the unbelievers. No. To abstain from the flesh, the desires that wage war against you, against your soul. The real battle is within for these Christians. They're not busy fighting the society. That's the first half. The second is, act honorably, live good lives among the unbelievers. Verse 12 is one of my favorite verses. In fact, verse 11 and 12 should go together. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshy desires that wage war against you. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that in a case where they speak against you, as those who do what is evil, they will, by observing your good works, glorify God on the day of visitation. Speaking, I think, of God's coming in glory at the end of the age, when all the secrets of the hearts are revealed. Notice this. They're told to conduct themselves honorably among the unbelievers, among the Gentiles. This assumes that the unbelievers will recognize good conduct when they see it. I mentioned in the first point the distinction between the church and the secular world, but Peter assumes also there are many values and virtues which the secular world the, the Hellen, will recognize as good. There's a great deal of overlap. And in fact, you are the best way to overcome people who think you're a bunch of weirdos and a cult, which is what they thought of the early Christians, is to show by your honorable conduct that you're not, by your good deeds. So in fact, they may even, as it were, glorify God on the day of visitation. He then outlines what he means by good, or act honorably. What does it mean? Well, it's parallel to Jesus' phrase, give back to the emperor, what is the emperor's? Very next sentence, sentence th verse 13. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord. And that summarizes it. By the way, the word, the Greek word is actually every human creation, institution. Now, if it's a human institution, why should I submit to it? I'm free because I'm, I'm a slave of God, right? I'm a free man. Paul said that. Peter said that. No. Submit to every human creation because of the Lord. It's your service to God to pay honor to the emperor. In fact, he says this, whether to the emperor as supreme authority, it's now no longer Tiberius, it's probably Claudius or even Nero in his early days, we're not quite sure, before he went mad. Submit to every human authority because the Lord, whether to the emperor as supreme authority or to governors sent as those sent out by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do what is good, for it is God's will that you silence the ignorant of the foolish by doing good. 
As God's slaves, live as free people. Don't use your freedom as a way to conceal evil. That's the double focus. Um, now, of course, the church can do that. I, the church can be so clear on its own identity that it has nothing to say or do with the society around it. Um, we must understand that Peter expects the Christians to be engaged in honourable conduct and submission to the institutions and life of their society, insofar it's consistent with uh, serving Christ. And the focus is put beautifully in verse 17. Honour everyone, honour all men, love the brothers, that is, the believers. Honour all, but love the brothers. See that both and, and yet not equal. And then at the very last words of the text I've got tonight, an uncanny echo of Jesus' own words with which we began. Fear God, he says. Honour the emperor. God, what give to God what is God's? What does God deserve for our fear, our reverent fear? Because we invoke as Father, the one who will judge our deeds, as Peter writes. The emperor? No, the emperor deserves honour. Even a Roman emperor. And that's how we're to live in a secular society. Maintaining our identity, but acting honourably, living good lives among the unbelievers. Now, now I'm going to have questions in just a moment, so don't despair. I've not given you a set of rules in fact, I don't think it is a question for a set of rules, though we may tease out some of the challenges in just a moment. It's more a way of being, a way of being and practicing Christian virtue as God's slaves, free from human creation, and yet because of God, voluntarily submitting and engaging fully with the society, the secular, be that mean just neutral or possibly even negative society around us. 